Well, it's been a great day. Hallelujah. It's, uh, we've had a thunderstorm. Thunder, lightning, lots of rain. Those clouds are beautiful up there at the moment. It's just a lovely evening. You know, the temperature's good, but I can feel a bit of rain in the air, actually. So I don't know whether I'm going to finish this. But anyway, let's start. I'm going to speak about holiness or the holy. And I'm doing it in response to somebody who watches our videos. And he said, could we speak on Leviticus 19 verse 2, which says, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, what does it mean, holiness? What did God mean when he described himself as holy? In searching for the meaning, we shall find that this word, is like a bird that cannot be caught. It eludes our grasp all the time. And that's the genius of the word. And that's the exciting thing about holiness. It's always, always, always beyond us. Hallelujah. When the angels cry holy, they are not giving a definition of God. They are proclaiming a mystery. In fact, the mystery of mysteries. Hallelujah. There's no word like it for putting intellectual pride in its place. It expresses an idea that calls for faith and trust, not intellectual expertise. Now, there is no better way to prepare for the coming encounter with God than to deepen our awareness of his holiness. The unbeliever will be compelled to seek the security of Jesus if he's wise, and the believer will be inspired to seek God all the more. There's something in us, you know, God put eternity into our hearts and that eternity in our hearts seeks God, seeks God for fulfillment of life, for a meaningful life, for satisfaction, for the reason we were put in this world in the first place is to seek and to find God. Hallelujah. Now, in trying to capture the holy, many great theologians have arrived at phrases such as Sublime exaltedness and overpowering majesty. It's a pretty good description of holy. It's a good description and beautiful words. Another one. Complete freedom from everything impure and unrighteous. Amen. God is pure and free from all unrighteousness, of course. And another one. The fullness of God's ethical qualities, his goodness, purity and righteousness. These are all wonderful expressions. But when we are in the actual presence of God, what do they mean? What will they mean when we're standing before God? All these wonderful phrases and expressions. Imagine that you've walked into a vast room in a palace and the crystal chandelier has fallen to the marble floor and shattered into a thousand fragments. You pick up one fragment of a broken crystal pendant and think that you can now describe by this little shard of crystal that you can now describe the glory of the chandelier when it hung there from the ceiling with all the candles, the hundreds of candles within it, sparkling and shining there in the middle of the room. We wouldn't even be able to imagine that chandelier if we'd never seen it before. We'd look at that broken piece of glass and try and imagine it, but it would be impossible. And so with the idea of holiness, our words, as wonderful as they are, the words of these theologians, they fall hopelessly short of defining holiness. And we stand, as it were, embarrassed with all our words, as wonderful as they are, scattered around us like dry leaves in the autumn. But there's laughter among the leaves. God has been watching our search and he rewards us with the secret. In our struggle to define and understand holiness, we've discovered something. It can't be defined. Hallelujah. It isn't meant to be defined. That's the whole point. And that's why it is a major blow to intellectual pride and our fallen nature's need for definition and for the safety of definition. We like to organize and define, but God won't allow it when it comes to to the holy. Now when the angels cry, holy, 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 kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzavaot, Lord God of hosts, the last thing in the world that they are doing is defining God. It would be incongruous, impertinent, for them to declare that God was, say, pure, 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 
whilst all of heaven thunders with the glory of his presence, and just as inappropriate to declare the fullness of his virtues as the train of his robe fills the temple with transcendent clouds. Every word becomes trivial, irrelevant, yet still the host of heaven cry holy. God is in the midst. Let everyone bow down in worship. The Lord is in his holy temple. Hallelujah! And the words thunder out, holy, holy, holy. Now they seem to me to be expressing their humble awe and amazement at one so unlike anyone or anything in existence. In fact, he is existence itself, pure existence, pure life. Every moment in the presence of such life is different from the moment before and is different from the moment to follow. Every moment will be different when we're in his presence for eternity. Hallelujah. The angels, you see, have relinquished the effort to define him. And they stand overwhelmed, repeating the one word, Kadosh. It's a happy confession of inadequacy. Wonderful, childlike inadequacy. Angels have faith and humility, the two prerequisites for enjoying holiness. Remember, they are witnessing the entire chandelier, so to speak, in all its splendour and much, much more. What we have to understand is that holy contains all of the familiar ideas that usually come to mind, such as pure and sacred, but the reality soars way beyond even the beginnings of our comprehension. God is wonderful. That is to say, he is beyond understanding, which is the meaning of the Hebrew word Pele, which is translated wonderful. It means we can't understand him. He's beyond our understanding. There is no one like him. The beauty of the word holy is that we can't get on top of it, so to speak. We can't master it. It's always beyond sight. It's that bird that can't be caught. It sings to us on one branch. We reach out and it disappears only to appear on another branch. For me to try to define the word holy will be a little like my reading the title page, The Plays and Sonnets of William Shakespeare and going no further, closing the book. And then somebody asks me what his writing is like. And I try to answer from what I read on the title page. It's soon very clear that I haven't a clue what I'm talking about. The holiness of God is something that we have to taste or experience rather than seek to comprehend. That's what the angels are doing and all that any creature can ever hope to do. Nevertheless, God does reward the humble and earnest searcher. We must be humble and we must be earnest. If a proud man was in the heavenly assembly, he'd be the unhappiest creature alive. I imagine him throwing up his arms in despair and saying, God can't be defined. At the same time, the humble man has raised his arms in wonder and is saying with totally different emphasis, God can't be defined. God can't be defined. Maybe he'd prefer the word holy. And that humble man may also be doing a jig, a dance, as he looks at what cannot be defined, and it fills his heart with joy. You see, one, the proud man is frustrated and afraid. The other is full of wondering praise. His heart is open, but the proud man's heart is closed. And it's in the heart that we experience holiness, not in the mind, it's in the heart. It's why God says, open your hearts to me. Solomon pleased God because he prayed for a lave shemaya, which means a listening heart. Do you see what's happening here? The proud man has great difficulty accepting the unknown, the radically new. He panics to fit everything into his system of thinking, to get it safely categorised. And when he can't, he dismisses it. But he can't dismiss holiness, so he has to dismiss himself. The proud and untrusting have 
can have a concept of holiness that never rises further than the banal and familiar descriptors of pure, righteous, sacred. But he remains earthbound in those descriptors, trapped in his own pride and lack of trust in God. That's why the proud soul is barren, because it moves in a closed and fearful circle. By stark contrast, the humble man is always ready to recognize the exceptional and to be filled with wonder without feeling the need to clothe the exceptional with the familiar. You see, he is able to stand aside and admire the bird as it flits from branch to branch or rises in the air. And the real wonder of it is that the humble share in the freedom of holiness. Like the angels, he knows what the holy is and also like them, he can't explain it. He has happy courage in the presence of the unknowable because he has trust and humility. We accept then that we'll never mentally comprehend the word holy, but let's look closer anyway and see if we can uncover just a little more of the meaning behind it. We must be humbly inquisitive like children. What play brick then can we choose that closest resembles what the angels may mean when they cry, Kadosh, Kadosh, Holy, Holy. After a little thought, I suggest we use the brick with the word unique written on it. God is unique. By the way, I also like the word beyond. God's holiness, like a mountain, soars out of sight beyond. But the trouble is with beyond, it sounds a little bit too mystical. Unique should do nicely for the time being. Unique means, above all, that we have nothing with which to compare him, let alone a vocabulary sufficient to define him. I like this. We're on the right track. God is beyond all definition. That's what astounds the angels and fills them with adoring praise. And this word unique tells us why we are so dumbfounded. The unique has no prototype. It isn't part of a series. There is no form or category to which the idea can be attached. We are in the presence of something not only unknown, but unknowable. We sometimes have a fleeting sense of the holy in worship or in prayer. We have a fleeting sense of it, like a flash of light in the darkness that remains for a few seconds and is gone. The secret to learn is how to maintain that awareness permanently, how to seal that experience in our hearts and to live with that experience, living in the presence of the holy, the ineffable. You know, after people have visited Niagara Falls, they may say, we've never seen anything like it. But it's still only water falling over a precipice. Sure, it's a lot of water and it's a high precipice, but both things are familiar. That isn't, Niagara Falls isn't really unique. God's uniqueness is absolute, quantitatively and qualitatively. He is, if we may use the term, one-off. Our tributary has now merged with another, and I seem to hear God saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. When the angels cry, Holy, they are agreeing that he is one, that there is only one of him, but there is much more. They are declaring that he is unique, not just that there is only one of him, but that his oneness is unique. He is unique. We have nothing with which to compare him. They are in the presence of radical mystery and they know it. This is when that proud man runs for the exit. He wants to be anywhere but here. The proud man, you know, won't need to be banned from heaven. He'll ban himself. He's threatened by the presence of the holy for obvious reasons. He craves the safety of definition. That's why people read their daily star forecast. They hope to define the future and be prepared for it. But nothing can prepare us for the holy except humility and trust. The holy contains the idea of beyond. 
beyond sight, beyond understanding, beyond imagination. What brings joy to the angels and to the humble fills the proud with horror. It is here that the humble come into their own. They know that within the mystery is a furnace of tender and undying love. Their future is in good hands. We know that the humble would have their day. We knew this all along because Jesus said the last shall be first. Well, this is their day, the day of the humble. The humble person is in a position to note that the angels, although stunned by God's holiness, his uniqueness, his beyondness, have not fled the scene. In fact, the glory of God's holiness radiates on them and through them. The angels must be the humblest of God's creatures. That one isn't. <laughs> the angels must be the humblest of God's creatures. And this humility guides them to the very throne itself. Hallelujah. The seraphim are flames that are drawn inexorably back into the fire of God's holiness. In fact, seraph in Hebrew means flames. Excuse me. <laughs> He's attacking me. <laughs> Seraph means flame. That's a beautiful thing. And they seek to return to the, to the intense furnace of God's love. That is when it dawns on the humble man that he is still there. He may pinch himself, as it were, that he hasn't been rebuked by God or by his own heart. In fact, he feels more than he has ever felt. Standing there at the foot of God's mountain of holiness that soars beyond, he feels that he's been sort of rearranged. Not that something has been added, but that what he already had and what he had gained throughout his life has been somehow reassembled. He's still him. In fact, he's more him than he's ever been. That's a paradox. Who can dwell with the consuming fire? The humble can. Because of his joy in knowing God's uniqueness and being forgetful of the trifling fact of his own ignorance, he worships God in a way that he's never worshipped him before. In the presence of the holy, his ignorance is bliss. And in the heavenly waves of adoration, he may hear snatches of words from the scriptures. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in its clearness. They saw God and did eat and drink with him. In his light we see light. God dwells in a high and holy place and also with the humble of heart. Now there's a turn up for the books. A king who lives with the nobodies. That's unique. That's holy. And now I painted myself into a corner. If holy means unique, how can God possibly command us to be unique? Something is either unique or it isn't. You can't command something or somebody to be unique. But Leviticus 19 verse 2 says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. We'll look at that in the next video. Thanks for watching.